December 19th, Slam Nuba asked me to uh, take part in a poetry workshop. And I wanted to be able to make sure that we had a video to be able to get to folks who wanted to be there and weren't able to. And also as an artifact for myself as well. Um, in the future, I'll probably be working on more workshops and I wanted this to be a starting point. Um, so I'm recording it now for you. Um, so this is the material from there. I have a big pile of materials um, and also an outline that I wrote uh, to keep me on track. Um, so, all right. Um, originally, we did this on December 19th for Slam Nuba's Instagram. Um, and I got to talk with Eric Francis, who is wonderful. Um, if you haven't checked out his work, please do. Um, and also support Slam Nuba. Slam Nuba has been around a long, long time and does amazing work uh, for the community um, and a lot of beautiful um, poetry and performances coming out of Slam Nuba. So let's begin. Uh, my subtitle for this workshop is Sometimes the Poem is What's Right in Front of Us. And I'm just going to go ahead and read my outline for you. I think a lot about finding the words for the things that are difficult to express. And that's the beautiful thing about language and poets. Language is fluid. It plays, it experiments, and so do we. I think that's what we're meant to do. It's kind of one of our jobs. And that's not to say that poetry is solely a special appointment or occupation relegated to a special group. Ted Kuzer, author of the Poetry Home Repair Manual writes, Consider the ways in which so many of us waste our time. What would be wrong with a world in which everybody were writing poems? After all, there's a significant service to humanity and spending time doing no harm. While you're writing your poem, there's one less scoundrel in the world. And I'd like a world written you in which people actually took time to think about what they were saying. It would be, I'm certain, a more peaceful, more reasonable place. I don't think there could ever be too many poets. By writing poetry, even those poems that fail and fail miserably, we honor and affirm life. We say we loved the earth, but could not stay. And I agree with Kuzer that poetry is something that can help us all. And the tools that poetry teaches us are more necessary than a lot of folks would like to believe. One of the tools that people, I'm sorry, poetry, teaches us is that language is not stasis. It is action. It is constantly figuring itself out and it can constantly be refigured. As each of us wake up into specific ways of knowing, meaning, as each of us start to really know who we are, what we see, how we see, and on and on, when we are solid on our feet about these things, or if nothing else, feeling them deeply. We begin to have questions because the words for our experiences might not be totally there. They might be a little elusive for so many reasons. Perhaps the language we are speaking is borrowed. Perhaps the words we know only sort of say what we feel deeply. Perhaps the canon touts its definitions and beats us over the head with them without leaving an opening for us to get a word in edgewise. Often, we don't know what words we need. Often there are no words. So I would like to share with you some of the things that have worked for me along with some examples. Um, but first of all, and you can send this to me in a private message um, on any of my social media. Uh, my handle is at Siren Eats Poetry. Um, and um, yeah, I wanna ask you all, how do we say these things? How do you say these things? Do we create our own language? Um, if so, how? Uh, what other ways are there that can help us? Um, Eric Francis in our talk on the 19th talked about um, kind of pushing through language. And that's something that I wanna talk with him about a lot more. And I hope to talk with a lot of people about all the different ways that we learn how to say what we need to say when we don't know what we need to say. Like maybe we feel it so deeply in our body um, and um, or someplace in our mind, like different ways of knowing that aren't words. Um, so how do we connect those things? In my MFA work at Regis University, 
I wrote a lot about familial estrangement and mixed race identity and moving towards reconciliation and healing in regards to inflicted traumas. In my work going forward, I write about this and also work towards ever widening understanding of what true healing is and when, whether, how it's possible. There have been a lot of voices who have aided me in these efforts, both academic and in my personal circles. I want to share some of those things with you now. And I have separated these examples into ways into poems that I have found helpful. Um, and so that's what this whole pile of things is about. Um, so the first example I have for you is from Claudia Rankine's book, Citizen. Um, I recently taught this in a class um, and as did a lot of other people, um, <coughs> excuse me, for our composition students. And um, it's, it's a really important book and talks about, excuse me, um, race is at the forefront um, and so much more. Um, I highly recommend this book, Citizen and the American Lyric by Claudia Rankine. Um, so what I've written here is sometimes when there is no answer and when we are unable to precisely describe a feeling, we name the effect of the feeling and observe it. And this can be the poem. Um, on page 5960, um, here's what Claudia Rankine writes. To live through the day, sometimes you moan like a deer, sometimes you sigh. The world says, stop that. Another sigh, another stop that. Moaning elicits laughter, sighing upsets. Perhaps each sigh is drawn into existence to pull in, pull under, who knows? Truth be told, you could no more control those sighs than that which brings the sighs about. And on page 60, the sigh is the pathway to breath. It allows breathing. That's just self-preservation. No one fabricates that. You sit down, you sigh. You stand up, you sigh. The sighing is a worrying exhale of an ache. You wouldn't call it an illness. Still, it is not the iteration of a free being. What else to liken yourself to but an animal, the ruminant kind? Um, so like I said, that can be the poem. Um, and this, this book is really super phenomenal as are um, the multimodal and multimedia treatments of the book um, by Claudia Rankine and people she's collaborated with and also by others who have adapted the book, say, for theater, um, worth checking out. Um, that's a little bit of a side note. Um, so now I'm gonna go to my second example. Uh, it's from Zom Pham by Kamala Makarao. Um, I am actually writing a review of this book um, and I'm, I'm late and I want to um, just amplify this text as much as possible um, because it is absolutely beautiful and absolutely celebratory. Um, and um, in regards to this workshop, um, sometimes when our experiences are at, the at a confluence or at an in-between space of being, meaning when the bulk of presiding culture and or history has not acknowledged certain ways of being, when it has suppressed our ways of being and or ignored it, and we are being that, we exist, we're here, we use whatever it is we have. On page 63, uh, Kamala Makaral um, talks about um, their relationship with their father and um, both of them, and throughout the book, um, between the father, the mother, and Kamala, um, talking about um, kind of these junctions in culture and also each other, um, the things they've learned from their culture of um, how to be, um, you know, in their roles um, and how um, they need to communicate when they do not fit in those roles. I hope I have um, read, read that um, well enough. But anyway, let me read um, page 63 of this. My father, on the other hand, used his four rationed minutes to ask me, oh, I should say also, Kamala is talking about um, these phone calls that happened when they were in uh, college. And uh, the mother allotted about 11 minutes because the calls were very expensive. And the father got four minutes of that time. Okay, my father, on the other hand, used his four ration minutes to ask me about the weather, about what I had eaten for dinner, 
about my friends whom he didn't even know, or he would tell me something seemingly relevant or interesting he had read in the local newspaper, like Ananda Devi published a new novel, like Mauritius held its first pride parade, or he'd remind me that Kofi Annan went to MIT, Barack Obama went to Harvard, Malala just started a degree at Oxford. He collected information about Ivy Leagues, like marigolds threaded into a garland, he wanted to place around my neck. Every once in a while, he would throw in a word of encouragement, wishing me luck for my exams or giving me academic advice that he had picked up from Reader's Digest. Even though he never directly asked me, he skillfully created a vocabulary around newspaper trivia to show me that he cares. So that's the thing. We, I, we, one of my biggest things in life is that we start where we are, we do what we can. Um, and I come from a world of make do. Um, so there's a lot of um, improvisation and pulling different bits from everywhere um, to try to formulate, you know, a language around who I am. Um, and that enters into a lot of worlds and confluences and um, that example rang true for me and Kamala Mackerel's book is on the fan. Sometimes I um, kind of have these conversations with poets. Um, I, I've been doing a series of poetry postcards for a while on and off. And um, I tried to come up with small poems very, very quickly. Um, and so I have two examples here, but I'll start with my friend, um, Nishan Cook. Um, Nishan Cook is a poet in Denver who, and also a horse trainer, um, very beautiful human uh, who I've learned a lot from about life philosophy, living, learning, teaching, being human, and also poetry. Um, and so sometimes the poem is whatever is right in front of us. And that's definitely a lesson I got directly from Nashan. Um, sometimes the poem is precisely how we are seeing it. This reminds me of the gift that is found in traditional haiku. Often haiku focuses on images from nature, emphasizing simplicity, intensity, and directness of expression. Something that many people often miss in their haikus is that the haiku also often offers some kind of gift. It, maybe it's a realization, an image, a feeling, etc. Um, I've also seen haiku that offer up that gift in the form of a joke. Um, someone from uh, one of my MFA cohorts uh, actually did that with his haiku, and it's really, really fun. And I wish I had an example, but I don't. Um, I'll be writing a, 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 a so that, that I didn't need to read. But anyway, let me read this poem that I wrote um, for my poetry postcards. And it's um, from uh, Conversations with Poets. And this one's with Nishan Cook. I ask, how are you? He says, I'm seeing. I say, what are you seeing? He says that my darkness is self-blindness and that when I'm tired of being blind, I see as clearly as I want to. I say, ah. He says, my mind is all light now. It's very strange. I say, that's beautiful. He says, very strange. I ask, why? He says, it's new and not new, and I'm having a hard time writing about it. I say, lots of light and lots of God. He says, it's all silence, and it's painful, and it doesn't hurt. So you see, he didn't necessarily know exactly what the thing was, but he knew how he felt. He knew how it felt in his body. And um, in that moment, he, he was also teaching me um, and past my assumptions um, and whatever I might um, apply onto that situation. Um, I want to give some other examples, like just one from life. There's one that I've been trying to write into a poem that I haven't yet. And essentially, I was standing at a bus stop many years ago. I'm, I'm, I, for the last 20 years, been a pedestrian and bus rider and sometimes bicyclist, but not as often as I would like. Um, but anyway, I was, I was hanging out at a bus stop and there were these two people in front of me just arguing, like really fussing very loudly, very angry. Um, and you can tell they cared about each other, but they were just like, you know, at odds. And 
at the same time that this argument was happening and we were all waiting for the bus. I don't know if y'all have seen like maybe in coloring books or cartoons or maybe even movies where you see a picture of the sun shooting through the clouds in a certain way where there are these bold sun rays just shooting out all over the place and the sun's like setting a little bit and it just looks absolutely beautiful and this is something they're missing because they're fighting you know the the cars are passing back and forth and everything and um uh, they're just so mad they can't see anything else i kept trying to get their attention um, and I also felt really sad because I could tell they cared about each other and they were having this amazing fight. Um, and so when one of them looked my direction, because I kind of stepped up a little bit, um, but not too forcefully, um, cause you don't, you know, you don't do that on the street. You don't know what people are about or whatever. And I kind of motioned towards this amazing thing that's happening in the sky and the argument stopped. And that was the poem that I've never written on paper. Um, and so um, that is a wonderful gift that my friend gave to me. My last example is a tiny poem um, that I hope to publish soon in a book of love poems. Um, or a, it's not love poems necessarily, but it's a book centering around the subject of love um, and just um, like trying to heal about a lot of things and forgive a lot of things and also just like, find a gift in each love story, even when it turned bad. Um, but uh, a friend of mine, um, Sarah Kayat, um, she's also from Regis's um, Mile High MFA, um, creates these chat books for folks or has um, through her press um, so that they have something to give to folks when they do readings and things like that, because often we don't. Um, and this poem came out of um, just a talk with someone I kind of had a crush on, um, but I never told them. And I think in that moment they were maybe hinting, but maybe not, um, about, well, a missed opportunity. And um, this was the poem, and it's called The Feudalist. She said, the world is on fire and it is 3 p.m. on our final day. Things being as they are, shouldn't we fall in love more? I will nod until midnight, staring into an infinity of openings. She's left. I stare at the door. My song is different now. Um, and so that's one of those um, poems of just like, the moment is what it is, and that, that is the poem. I was trying to think about ways of getting into those places where we feel or think something, but we don't know how to access it and translate it into words. And I was thinking a lot about surrealism and specifically um, Matthias Savalina's work, Spalina's work, Matthias Spalina's work, um, and how Matthias really works with dreams. Um, and of course, dreams is definitely one of those ways that we can access the unconscious. And it, it also um, shows us kind of the truth and the things we're thinking about often in symbolic language, um, which is really great for poetry um, and also surrealistic works. And so I wanted to share some of Matthias's work um, with you um, uh, because I've definitely been influenced over the last little while by this work um, and greatly admire it. And it's a way in. Um, this example is from a little um, handmade chapel called 11 Erotic Dreams. Um, and notice erotic is a little scare quoted. <laughs> um, and so um, these, these, these works are, are created with a lot of um, humor and insight. Um, that come through and, you know, in, via surrealism. You take all the words the one you love has ever said and gather them into a pile and carry the pile to the shed. 
In the shed, you polish all of the words, polishing each into a gleaming mirror. You arrange the mirror words all around you, entirely encircling you, but in such a way that each mirror word reflects another mirror word and reflects back into another. So you see an infinite reflection of words in every direction, and in none of the mirror words do you see yourself reflected. You find this disappearance deeply satisfying. Um, so yeah, um, what happens when we dream and are telling the truth, all these things. Um, uh, and I just, yeah, I just really resonate with those works. Um, other ways that we can get to it, like accessing the subconscious or unconscious. Um, sometimes that happens via dreaming, like I said. And when we are waking, like you tell me, what are some of the ways in which we can access our subconscious? Um, and a lot of times there are some really neat games we can play. And so I just tried to pick most of the um, games that most of us probably know, because maybe you forgot that these can be ways in to finding the words, finding the images, finding the feelings, all the things um, for your poems and for your creative work. A lot of them come from surrealism, like The Exquisite Corpse, one of my personal favorites. Um, essentially, you get a group of people together and uh, you have each one write a line without them seeing everyone else's line. And personally, I've done this multiple ways. Like you have people write a line and throw it in a hat and mix it up, make it super, super random. Um, or um, I've done it um, during COVID times where um, I asked folks to send me a line, any line, and I made kind of a broadside experiment out of it um, so that I could send it to all of them. Um, and that was a really fun way to go about it. Um, and of course, there's the old, um, you know, cast around a circle or around a room and you write a line, fold it over so no one can see it, and the next person, next person, next person, um, and then you read it all at the end. Um, and it's a really fun exercise um, that I really love. Um, there's the game of telephone. Telephone's fun because, you know, your message that starts at the beginning of the circle totally deteriorates or changes into sometimes a completely far-fetched other thing at the end of the circle. Um, and so that's a fun game. Um, it also reminds me of the Spoonbill N7 generator. Um, if any of y'all want any of these resources, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, just send me a personal message, shout out on, on social media or whatever. Um, just let me know. Um, and you can also look it up, the Spoonbill N plus seven generator. Um, it's really fun. You just plug in um, some passages or lines and then, um, see what happens in the generator. Essentially, n plus seven is noun plus seven. Um, I learned this from one of my workshops in my MFA with Eric Baus, who's a ph phenomenal poet and also an amazing person. Um, and um, sometimes what comes out of the generator is like pure magic. Sometimes it's just gobbledygook. Um, and you just have to pick and choose um, to find out what you like. Um, dreaming, we've already mentioned that free writing and automatic writing or automatic drawing. Um, these are definitely skills that help move towards finding the words and finding the ideas, finding out what you know, um, finding out what you have questions about, um, finding out what you're frustrated about because sometimes they're so inside of us like we, we don't have access to them um, kind of you know on the outset. So free writing gets to it. Um, Julie, I don't know if you all know about Julia Cameron, way, way back she wrote a book called um, The Artist's Way, and in The Artist's Way she talks about writing three whole pages every morning, just free writing, not letting your pen lift up from the paper, and she's really adamant about you handwriting this free writing as well. Um, of course, there are other ways. Um, we know that not everyone is able to do that for multiple different reasons. We have so many neat recording devices now. Um, and so like I know that like talking things out and rambling or talking with other people, those are also ways that we can get uh, to the meat of what we need to get to um, in order to write good stuff. What else do we have here? Um, assemblages. 
Um, you can do it with imagery or words like collage. Um, and there are so many amazing things happening in poetry and other art um, with collage and incorporating uh, multiple modes and media. Um, and I haven't gotten a list compiled or anything like that. I invite you to find things. If you find things that are really cool, please send them to me. Um, if you feel so inclined and want to have that conversation, um, I get excited about learning about these new things. Divinatory poetics. Um, this has become one of my favorite things over the last couple of years. Um, and you can find out more about divinatory poetics through the works of C.A. Conrad and also Sela Satterstrom. I'm not totally sure if I'm saying her name right. Um, I consider Sela an absolute angel in the Denver writing community, literary community. Um, this is, I don't know if you can see, I'm trying to get it so you can see the book. It has a snake on it. That's good. Oh, we can almost see it. Um, sorry about that. But the book is called Ideal Suggestions, Essays in Divinatory Poetics by Sela Satterstrom. Um, it is on, which press is this on? Essay Press. It was published in 2017. I won't read uh, um, any examples from this just yet. I'm still processing this book and also rereading it. So check it out. Um, you'll get some good stuff from that and also CA Comrade's work. Uh, so what are divinatory poetics? Um, for starters, it can be collaborative and improvisational experiments. Um, and CA Conrad does a lot of those things and they're really fun. Oh, they're so fun. Um, uh, tarot is used often. Um, my friend Tabitha Dial has done a lot of that work with tarot and also runes and also tea leaves, um, creating poems and new writing from um, those readings and the images and symbols that are contained therein. Um, it could um, be bibliomancy. Bibliomancy is really fun. You all can't see my desk and there's a reason for that, but you, know, you take like a pile of books or your bookshelf and um, just pull at random um, lines and see what happens. Um, there's some pretty cool stuff that happens there. Another thing you can do is create new myths, superstitions, proverbs, and um, kind of reformat, recreate forms. Um, and um, again, another person who does that is Matthias Salina and um, very well. Um, there's this um, book called My Team Recipes, which is really fun. Um, and I kind of, I want to read a little bit from that. And then I also would like to read a short piece from America at Play, where um, Matthias takes the idea of games and um, uses those as kind of the catalyst for a lot of beautiful insights. Um, harrowing too, um, that, um, you know, are really touching and pertinent in ways that they wouldn't have been if, you know, if, if they had been written in any other way. So I'm going to read Simple Fake Smile Souffle. Uh, it's from the Book of Recipes. You take two tablespoons finely grated Parmesan cheese, one cup whole milk, 15 to 18 fake smiles, three tablespoon unbleached all-purpose flour, one half teaspoon paprika, one half teaspoon salt, pinch of ground nutmeg, four grimacing smiles, five attempted smiles, one cup packed coarsely grated Gruyere cheese. Gruyere cheese. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. One, position rack in lower third of oven, preheat to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Bake a smile into the oven. If it comes out as a grimace, that's okay. Two, butter six cup, one and a half quart souffle dish. Fake a smile to the dish. Tilt dish coating bottom and sides with fake smile. Three, warm milk in small saucepan over medium low heat until steaming. Remove from heat. Four, fake a smile to the steaming milk while you melt six fake smiles in a large saucepan over medium heat. Add flour and whisk until mixture begins to foam and loses the raw taste of unacknowledged fear about three minutes. Five, remove saucepan from heat. Let stand one minute. Pour in warm milk, whisking until smooth. Return to heat and cook, whisking constantly until very thick, fake smiling every two to three minutes. Remove from heat. 
pussy and paprika, salt and nutmeg. Add grimacing smiles one at a time. Whisking to blend after each addition, scrape souffle base into large bowl, cool to look warm. Six, using electric mixer, beat attempted smiles in another large bowl until stiff. Fold a quarter of attempted smiles into lukewarm or room temperature souffle base to lighten. Fold in remaining attempted smiles in two additions while gradually sprinkling in Gruyere cheese. Transfer batter to prepared dish. Seven, place dish in oven and immediately reduce oven temperature to 375 degrees. Bake until souffle is popped in golden brown on top and center moves only slightly when dish is shaken gently about 25 minutes. Bake a single 20 minute long fake smile at that oven door, but do not open it. Eight, serve immediately. Fake a smile to each diner as you serve. Um, so as I said, a lot of humor um, in that work and um, a lot of fun and um, just an, a, a different way of, um, I don't know, accessing a lot of different ideas. I think I'm gonna read this last short piece um, from America at Play um, by Matthias Spalina. And um, yeah, let's read page 71, A Legal War. For 10 or more players. In the morning, the teacher gives one child a box of freshly sharpened pencils. Their tips are so pointy. They smell like raw wood and engine. Throughout the day, this child sneaks the pencils into the book bags of his classmates. He must be very careful so that no child discovers him unzipping the plastic zippers of their book bags, so that no child sees him with his small hand inside her blue book bag or possibly yellow. Throughout the day, the children discover the freshly sharpened pencils in their book bags and begin to draw and write with them. They chew the erasers. They break the tips. At the end of the day, the teacher asks for pencils back from the child. This game is especially good for boys who are afraid of the dark. And so, those, hopefully those are good examples for y'all about um, different ways that we can, um, I don't know, find a way to um, new work in finding our words. Um, I hope to talk about this a whole lot more going forward. Um, this is just a tiny start um, and it's also kind of like a crash course, really. Um, and also I'm still formulating it. And so I'd be stoked to hear about um, what other folks are doing in this realm, um, because I know a lot of us are on the same boat. We are um, ready and we are learning how to say what we need to say. Um, and I think that's really super important. Um, in my work, um, I've, I've done a lot of um, work on the personal, spiritual, and psychological level um, to be able to say some things that um, need to be said. And here's something I've learned um, through my work, not just as a writer or educator, um, but also as someone who has worked in the healing arts for eight years as a massage therapist, um, in order for healing to happen, and this is something that was said to me too by a lot of folks, in order for healing to happen, we first have to say the thing. We first have to recognize and say the thing. Now we don't dwell there, right? Um, but how do we get to the point of saying it? Um, and so, that's what I hope um, some of these talks will do. Um, and also, I want to be in conversation with people who are doing this. Like, how are we doing it? How are we finding the words? What is the work we need to do? Like, um, you know, and um, how do we know when we're ready? Um, and it's okay if we're not ready. And that's another thing I want to add. So really, this is just a conversation on the first step. I would love for any of you all to reach out to me if you'd like. Um, at Siren Eats Poetry is my social media handle. And um, hopefully this has been helpful for folks. Um, and again, I'm truly thankful for um, Slam Nuba inviting me to do this workshop. And um, this video will be sent out to the Slam Nuba community. And I will also be posting this on um, my social media as well. I hope you are all well. Um, that you are supported, that you have everything you need, um, and, um, you know, that you're okay through all this craziness that we're experiencing. 
Um, and if you can write about it, um, we need people to write about it. And if they are able to, um, that's all I have. Um, thank you so much for listening and I will see you around. All right. Take care.